Okay, thank you. Good. Well, welcome to 2024, everyone. I'm Delight Mouth. I'm one of the training specialists, and I'm joined by some other SDS staffers, including Kara Thrasher Livingston, Hello. Anna Williams, and Kat Sawalapinskas. You're muted, Kat. Hello. Sorry, I'm trying to answer <laughs> some emails of last last minute folks asking how do I get in. <laughs> That is okay. Did you, if you're um looking in the chat, you'll see that Kat chatted into the message area a couple of really important documents, including the agenda for today, a flyer for our individual and families office hours, and then some Harmony Guide updates. And so what we're hoping to do is we're still getting a couple of people admit in. Oh, people aren't seeing them in the cat. A chat. Cat, I think maybe it's oh, no. dependent on when you join the meeting, the... if you can see them. Can you see them, Delight? And Anna, I can. can. you guys see them? Kara can't see them. Okay. So maybe we'll wait a few more minutes and I'll do it again so that... Everybody else can see. Can okay. anybody see them other than us internally? Because that's not good. I got a message that it does depend on when you join. So let's just give it a minute before we add them again. And what I can do is I can, I'm going to test it by seeing if I can download what it, um, what we chatted in and see if I can open it up. Let's see where it just went off to. Because Kat was so kind to create an agenda for us for today. And it, most, it really has a lot of important links. So I was able to pull that. So once we get that in there, we will be able to hook you up with those. And if for whatever reason you can't download it from the chat, we're going to email you all credit for the CEH and the hours. So it's okay if you can't, for whatever reason, download it. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And from there, let's see. You'll notice that First up, we're giving you a reminder that we have an individuals and families office hour. We're really hoping to build a bridge to families to help them as needed um, and answer any questions they might have. We have been holding a quarterly um, office hour that was intended to be a routine explanation on eligibility. Other states have done that and it's been really successful as far as just having a continue, a consistent eligibility discussion point. So we're expanding that to an office hour. Kara, is there anything you want to add to that just as far as, you know, the purpose of the office hour and what a care coordinator can expect? Um, sure, for office hour, uh, for families and individuals, it's new. Um, if you have... I can hardly hear you, Kara. Sorry, I don't know if the lights have some experience. But Sorry. Really better. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> Much better. So for individual and family office hour, we really want it to be, um, you know, a safe space for individuals and families to come and ask their questions. We do have the training about eligibility. That's more of like where we take up a lot of time to explain eligibility, then take some questions, you know, about eligibility. Um, but this is just for people who are curious, um, people who have a question about their particular case, uh, they need something explained, you know, that type of thing. So we're just really encouraging it to be for individuals and families. Um, and we're hoping that you can use it as a tool like that, like, if you have an individual or family who would like to come to the office hour, you can give them the link. And um, if you both are working on something that uh, you want to work with us on, meaning the person and and you, the care coordinator, then you could both come to that. 
um, outside of situations like that, we're really hoping for it to be, you know, for individuals and families and there won't be lecture or anything, you know, external to learn um, in that. So we're just expecting individ individuals and families and, you know, we're not going to kick people out if they show up, you know, like if a care coordinator comes in, but we're going to expect that you're there with an individual and family, I guess is the best way to put it. We just want to make people, you know, a lot of times people say, yeah, I don't understand. I don't know what is this and what is that? And, you know, it'll be just us staffing it. Um, we're just helping to build a bridge and give people a, a good uh, a good resource or another resource to to talk directly with the state about their questions. So that's basically it. Awesome. Thank you, Kara. So next we have a whole bunch of webinars slated for 2024. Quite a few. So the first one that's coming up this Monday is January on January 8th from 11 to 12:15 it's a disability termination services with DVR so division of vocational rehab why would you want to go if you're a care coordinator that does any work with employment services please consider attending so that you can have a better understanding of the dynamics with DVR that's a required initial step before you can request employment services for long-term supports. So if you can, please check that out. Another really big one coming up is actually for this Friday, and it's a discussion on residential habilitation service definitions for group home and family home. What does that boil down to? This is stakeholder engagement to talk about the different definitions of these services. We're really carving out a difference between group home and family hab home. So please consider coming. Please encourage anyone that either receives the services or provides the services to come because we really rely on your input to be able to create regulations that are reflective to real life practices. So we really need you to participate in these kind of activities and this kind of session. Um, so you can register for that, uh, that um, through the documents that Kat emailed you. She, e she put in the chat, she emailed everybody. You can click the link and register that way. Finally, we're down to a notice of proposed regulations change for general relief. So this is the first step. Well, it's not the first step in the process, but it's the first notice that there's a change coming for GR. And so that is another opportunity to explore for participating in changing systems and changing support systems and engaging in the process. And that's occurring on January 8th from 12 to 1. So two things coming up on Monday and one thing coming up this Friday. So please keep those in mind. <clears throat> excuse me so special topics of the day the first one we'll skip the t24 because that's i'll i'll get deep into that but i wanted to turn it to uh kara or kat to talk about annual appointments uh do either of you want to just kind of do a shout out to the new year and something that care coordinators should incorporate to their practice with their their alaskans Sure, just really quickly reminder, you know, this is a new year, new me kind of thing, but just a reminder to make sure that all your folks receive the annual, at least annual medical screenings and dental and hearing and vision. There's some performance measures associated with that. I know the, that information goes on the support plan. Reviewers can look for that. They ask for that. They ask for updates. Uh, so just a reminder and a quick plug to make sure to plan uh to do these visits you know encourage your your clients and your your people to to 
see their providers regularly and assist them if they need them. And I know there's some issues with QDCs and maybe getting the medical documents. It's kind of a separate issue from just a regular annual uh, follow-up. I don't know, Kara, if you wanted to add something. Something. Um, that's just it. I mean, it, it, you did good. The the um, you know, regular visits are something that we don't want to let go um for people. And I know that our zone is very much the Medicaid waiver zone. Um, but we can also be encouraging for people and helpful for people to remind them and give them resources for things that they, you know, things that might be helpful to get them to regular appointments. There is transportation available through the medical provider, for example. Um, so, you know, that would be just be referring them to the medical provider for that kind of transportation. But in any case, um, yeah, just to support health and safety and our annual uh, annual visits to our medical medical caregiving staff. Thanks for that. It's just something that we really have to support for so many reasons. And you are one of the best uh, folks to remind your people of that. So thank you for helping us uh, with that effort to make sure everybody is uh, preventative and taking care of themselves. So thank you. So that brings us to the new Harmony Guide. And I just want to take a moment to say that 2023 was a year of slimming down the Harmony Guidebook. At one point, we had 130 six pages and we're now down to 118 and we're hoping to keep trimming that down as we find ways to make it more efficient. So what did we trim down? We've trimmed down a lot in the support plan and you can expect some additional changes to happen in the support plan in the future. These are changes that we were able to um, implement with the new year. They're going to start occurring in harmony within the next week. And so I'm going to go over just, it's kind of in chronological order of chapter, and I'm going to go through and kind of talk it through. But the big thing that I want you to know is that we're discontinuing plan validation as a specific step in harmony. So no more plan validation that is going away. So that's a, been a really big part of your, I won't say it's a critical part, but it has been a part of your process. And you're just, one day you're going to go in and you're not going to find plan validation. Okay. So don't panic. Nothing's broken. Same for a couple of spots and amendments. So before I get too deep into it, let's just kind of talk through some of the changes that have happened in our chapter four, which is the initial support plan chapter, we did get a report from a care coordinator that there wasn't a detail for uh, identifying expedited initial plan, renewal plan for the plan status types. So this change is added, is an added reference that you'll see in both the initial, the renewal and the amendment. Okay, so it's just a really small tweak. Then we have the removal of plan validation steps. So it's gone, it's been taken out. That includes running the report and reporting a reason to ignore validation. That's no longer a thing anymore. We also removed the provider search instructions because we have new tools for you. And we launched a YouTube video on it last uh, Friday. So we, we'll get into that towards the end. It's in your appendix. We also moved how to check for a provider certification status that's been moved to the appendix as well. So it's kind of a something that you might need for plant services. Maybe you don't, but you now have a instructional set for it there. We also moved the optional cost of support plans. So the overview sheet, that's been moved too. So we're kind of consolidating that into the other plan actions area. So from there, and Kat, if you see any questions pop through the chat, would you just stop me as I do this quick run, rundown? Thank you. So that takes us to an amended plan. So again, we have that reference to the plan status having an expedite. And then the removal for 
basis for amendment. So let's just be real clear here. When you go to plan information, you created a plan, you mark in its amendment, it would pop up two boxes asking for the basis for amendment and the requested action for the amendment. Those are now going to be removed. You won't see them. Why? Well, that information needs to be written out in the plan details form where you explain what's changing with the support plan. So we've removed those clicks in the system. So we're trying to slowly, we're trying to get rid of all of those clicks so that you can focus on the actual content of your support plan. So those have been removed. A big thing that happened last year was that the frequency and duration boxes used to require re-entry over and over and over again, even if you didn't need to change it. If you duplicated your plan, you had to re-enter it. Well, we fixed that, so that is no longer a thing. When you duplicate a plan, your frequency and duration from the last uh, submission will carry over. We are asking you to start putting in your total units in the plan service area. Uh, why? Well, so that when you look in the support plan, in the box that has your frequency and duration next to all the content that the total units are just located right there. So it's easy for planning teams to figure out how many units for that specific service within the plan. So we're encouraging you to start doing that. Um, <laughs> excuse me, I'm a little bit of a cold, so I'm coughing, sorry. Um, so again, we, similar actions to what you saw before, plan validation is out of here. Moved the optional support plan to other plan actions. And when we get down to the renewal, it's more of that same cleanup that we just saw. There's a reference to expedited renewals, validation uh, information's been pulled. We took away the frequency and duration uh, instructions to like, put them back in each time, but we are asking you to put in the total units for that area. And if you're doing a really complex breakdown, like someone's going, has like varying use throughout the year, or you have um, day hab in a residence or something like that, you're having to put in that information anyways. Um, we're just encouraging you to start doing that so that you can see it in the support plan. And then going further down, um, this is where we have that ad where we took it away from those other spots, moved the optional cost of the support plan to other plan actions. And then under our late support plan submission form, we had it free texted so that you could tell us all about uh, why you were late. And um, we found that that information really isn't as necessary as we thought. The drop downs cover it, you know, broad categories. It will open up if you select other for a reason for late submission. So if you can't find one of the reasons, like your support plan is going to be late and you can't find a category, you can then give additional description under other. Okay. The appendix. A couple of big things, providers search word merges. <laughs> Please check out the YouTube video on it. It's, it's a demonstrative video. In short, you can now search for providers within a client's record on that first demographics tab, there's a word merge report and you can pick the provider type you want and it'll pull all the providers based on the person's residence address. So definitely give that a, a view and or try it out yourself. If you have your if your clients like moving out of the city that they're currently living in, we do have an option for that. You just have to add an address and the video goes into that. And um, then the other two parts that were changed in the appendix include that we moved that certification, checking certification status, and we added that language option for editing a provider's record. 
All right. I know that was a lot of long, boring stuff, but um, Kat, is there, was there anything that I needed um, to re-clarify on? No, there was just a comment about uh, getting an incomplete for not having the weekly units enter. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I don't believe we're at incomplete state because you have that. So we'll have to look into that. This is just a best practice at this time. We're encouraging it as a best practice. Um, it isn't a requirement yet. We're encouraging it. We, we should do a show of hands of how many people are excited about the plan validation going away. Because we're stoked, guys. You have no idea. We fought, we fought and fought. And we are super excited that this is not going to be a thing. Just oh, good. I'm glad some of you. <laughs> I'm glad some of you are are cool with dropping that protocol. Um, yeah, that's pretty much what we had for Harmony updates. This was kind of one of those updates where it looks like a lot happened, but really it's removing stuff, less stuff, less to do, less to work with. So just trying to trim it down so it's a little bit more efficient. All right, um, going back to our agenda. We have some additional reminders. So we have the individual and family quarterly informational share session. So that's the eligibility session we were referring to earlier. And then we have our monthly provider info share, which is for all provider types to talk about anything big that would impact all providers. We, of course, have all of our resources for you. As always, you have CAT with care coordination support, and you've got provider office hours, care coordination hours, YouTube channel, uh, both policy and training, and of course, the training academy. So that's what we had for you today. Is there anything that you guys wanted to talk about or look at further? Just there were uh, some comments and questions about the flyer for the family office hours. And you guys are free to share that with whoever and however you feel is best. Um, there was a suggestion to maybe we should attach that to the support plan when we get those mailed out. So I'll reach out to the review teams about that. Uh, we did share with ADRCs and DDRCs already, so they know. Uh, but it, you know, if, if you want to share them on on social media pages that are relevant or anything like that, feel free to do that. We really want those hours to be for families to to be able to come and talk to us and you know ask questions about whether they're current recipients or the potential recipients, kind of anywhere anywhere and everywhere that they are in the process. It's just that they want to know what the process looks like. It's really for anyone who wants to talk to us about what SDS does and what services are available. And our first session is February 5th, so we have about a month before, before we start. The reason for that start is because there were holiday days that were Mondays, so. Yeah, and gives people time to kind of put it on their calendar everybody's calendars I don't know about you guys but everybody's calendars book up quickly and they're on they're at 12 noon I don't know if it says that on there it probably does I'm just not seeing it it does not but we could fix that that's but, okay um, it's, a, it's it the, lun cool. the lunch hour so people can join one of the thing about being a family is like how many meetings and stuff are during the time that you're supposed to be working <laughs> you know, between IEP and waiver meetings and and then, you know, then there's dinner time, which is like not a good time for meetings, but we are trying to make it easier for people to, uh, you know, to join. And we're hoping that people will. Well, I'm just kind of checking out some of our chats coming in.
great idea for future learning, a uh, complex behavior collaborative. So we're working on um, some collaboration with them under for training regarding documentation that would be done by, you know, a residence that is helping somebody who has a CVC plan because it gets kind of intense. Um, and a lot of times our DSPs, you know, they have good training with documentation, but they are not, they're not fully clued in on to the specificness of the CBC, what they're looking for. So we're hoping to make a, an extra documentation, not literally extra documentation, but another documentation class for, for people who are involved with folks who have a CBC plan. And just that's a, you know, work in progress. Not available right now, but we are working on it. We're always adding. We're hoping that this will be our year to have a full, you know, much more full uh, choice of classes in our LMS. And do more interaction with people that's just sort of structured around a topic or just structured around the discussion, as you can see with our office hours. Okay, so a couple of questions are coming in. Looking for. So good old CFC. I see we have a question on. Did you guys know we have a CFC training? I hope you do, because uh, <laughs> I presented it. Um, please, you don't have to watch all the videos. Maybe videos aren't your style. There's also a provider informational. It's like 10 pages of just everything you can imagine about CFC. And Jeannie's brought up a question in the chat about reapplications and specifically for CFC MVLOC where they're separate forms, but shouldn't they go together? You're right. And best practice, doesn't matter what combination of CFC you have, she's please put in both applications at the same time. The level of care application, whichever side of the house it goes to, NFLOC, IDD, wherever, and CFC. Put them in at the same time and just try to keep them put in at the same time. What we are finding is that there are delays sometimes between the different sides, like if it's going through IDD and NFLOC for CFC PCS, sometimes they don't line up. Um, there are timeframes where things don't line up. And if you're having issues with that, as far as the dates becoming misaligned, please let um, send a message to Kat. So with that kind of specific case example, I know Kat gets a lot of them as is, but we need to, we can't really look into things if we don't know about them. And sometimes they're just typos. People type in things incorrectly, not intentionally. It just, you know, they're still living in 2021. I know that sometimes I am. I'll just type in the wrong date and it's off. So please let us know because we do, we do not want these issues where the documentation so far away that determinations can't be made and that you're having issues with. Uh, VODs and QDCs and the timing of them, it doesn't fit. So please reach out to us on that so we can work with teams a little bit on managing that. Okay. There's some suggestions about a CFC box on applications. And we could bring that back to the teams for discussion and let them know this is the feedback we received. Um, there's more than one care coordinator saying that's absolutely, we could bring that back. Make no promises that they'll incorporate it, but we could certainly advocate for that. 
Yeah, there's been... We can bring that back. Well, there is some complexity to that just as far as how many workflows go, but um, we can talk to teams about it. Remember that you would still have to open up an inquiry and there are different pieces to it that we have to take care of anyways. Like if somebody wants you've see only, so there's some different dynamics to it. So, but we can talk to teams about that and see how they feel about kind of moving back to that approach. And cat on the fly, getting the times added. So good job. Well, I, um, we totally missed it. And we all looked at these flyers and we all we said, did. no, this is fine. So good catch on, on the time. Yes. Okay. Well, there's no rules for us staying the full time. You'll get your CEH either way if you were in today's session. We can leave the lines open for you for a few more minutes, but it looks like things are kind of cooling down. Um, so feel free to un... Um, you can skip off into the brilliant blue sunshine. If you're down here, at least there was some sunshine a few minutes ago, or you can um, uh, stick around and chat with us. Susie, I saw your chat in there. Are we collecting ideas for presenters for full, full lives for the conference? Always. If you have any ideas for presenters for full lives, if you're interested in attending Full Lives, know that that's one of our surefire ways to help you get a um, your training completed for your renewal. So that's one of the ways that you can accomplish that is by participating in the Full Lives Conference that's coming up in April. And we're getting close to the point where we do our call for proposals, where we solicit our um, wealth of information within our state of anyone who'd like to present. So if you're interested in presenting, keep an eye open for the call for proposals. We'll circulate that as well. But if you've encountered anybody, especially someone from Alaska, that would be an excellent keynote speaker, please let us know. Um, it's great to get people from out of Alaska to come, <coughs> excuse me, but I'll be honest, there's something really special about having presenters that are from here. They just kind of get it. They kind of get what's going on and get the scene. So if you know of anybody that will be an excellent candidate for that, or will be interested in that as a keynote speaker, or to participate by doing a workshop at Full Lives, please uh, connect with us. Susie's one of our care coordinators on the Full Lives Planning Committee. Did you want to unmute and say anything else, Susie? Do you have anything that you think we should make sure we touch on as well? Nope, I think you covered it all, Delight. Thank you. Um, just yeah. a reminder of the, the dates and locations. Oh yeah, it's somewhere new. It's going to be at the Sheraton this year. Is that right? I think so. Yes, right. at the Sheridan. Okay, and it's April. Oh, man. I might have to pull out my calendar. I think it's the 14th and 15th. I have 10th and 11th. Oh, see, you, I'm going to trust your dates a little bit more. Oh. <laughs> Just saying. I believe in you, Susie. But if either of us are wrong or it's somewhere in between, <laughs> we'll make sure you all know. Please keep your eyes posted for that. Okay, other comments, 
So we're still having issues with getting QDC and VODs and medical records. Oh, I I feel for I feel for you and I feel for all I feel for our entire healthcare system. Like let's just take a moment and acknowledge that the system has been significantly strained and has changed significantly since, you know, work processes before COVID and work processes after COVID. The only thing that we can tell you that we can advise you are best practices because, you know, you need to have them. They're part of the requirement. Best practice is to give at least 10 business days turnaround time, a minimum 10. If you can get more time for your request going into the clinic, probably for the better, but do your best to really develop that relationship with that provider in your community. What if that doesn't work? You know, then they're, you're doing your best to try to get that information, to get that VOD, to get those medical records, and it's still not coming in on time. We are going to ask you to file a quality assurance report telling you're going to need to tell us when you requested it. You need that time frame. Like I requested it on January 1st. I did not hear from them. You know, I followed up on January 10th, you know, and kind of going through and documenting it. Why a QA? Because the provider is a Medicaid provider and they do have an obligation to participate in this process and it's a quality assurance issue. So please document those concerns when you have them. Best and you may just need to talk to their office, talk to their office manager, talk to the the provider and say like how can we make this work? What do you need for this to happen on time? Because the ask, you know, the ask is genuine. We're not asking for extra stuff for fun. It's literally a requirement. So I know that's not the golden ticket answer that we're looking for, but that's the best practice we can give you at this time with that. Okay, so my chat keeps moving around, so I have to kind of regroup each time. So if any of my teammates wanted to jump in, please feel free. Patricia Lang had a chat um, question of when a client is on ISW and wants to add CFC PCS, who does the inquiry? Both, I, both the care coordinator and the PCS agency. Everybody files an inquiry. The PCS agency is going to need to file that their own ROI. At one point we like weirdly let like let you guys both do it like for each other and it turned into a hot mess so in the course of cfc we have let some things happen that we learned some big lessons from and one of them was everybody takes care of their own inquiry the care coordinator needs to do their own to and i know you've already filed your roi but it's actually to open the cfc program that's really what your inquiry is doing. It's opening the CFC program and you'll have to put in the application as well. So care coordinator, inquiry. Provider, well, going to serve the, the individual. They also have to file their own inquiry. Thank you, Susie and Patricia. This is Cheryl Yisley and Catch Cam. Mm -hmm. I have a question. What if you have, um, I'm working on a, a new waiver for someone ALI, and I'm positive the person is going to get PCS services. What if the agency that they've chosen does not do PCS services, and they, the only other agency here requires you to bring your own person? Hmm. Does that make sense? So, so they're not, they, they don't offer, they don't 
serve CFC PCS? Is that what you mean? Um, they're not taking any new ones because it doesn't make them enough money is what I was told. For PCS. So they'll do chore services, um, respite, but they won't do the PCS services. And most of the time with all of our ALI waivers, we need PCS services because that's really kind of where it all started. Right. Okay. And I'm guessing this just like, you know, we don't want to get into PHI or anything like that that the hiring procedure, like the person being able to locate their own provider, their own DSP might be difficult. Is that one? Yes. Of, um, yeah. Yes. We have, we okay. kind of have a workforce shortage. I think across the state we have that, but yeah. finding, well, and then I'll take the, take the challenge a little bit further. The other piece of this challenge is that what, what if the person that they want can't pass the background check? So, you know, we have two agencies, here that do the DSP. One has employees and one has you bring your own. Well, the person that you want that might be your family member can't pass the barring crime portion. So maybe they had something on their background that is questionable and the agency doesn't want to do a variance. And so they've reached out to all of their people in their circle and there isn't anyone. So I'm wondering what other people, at least in my area, are doing to remedy that because I see that as becoming a bit of an issue down here. Did you want to take that, Kara? I see you came off off. Well, uh, mute. it's it's obvious, you know, you can't be a provider if you can't pass the background check. You know, these are regs that the providers are trying. You can't be a PCA or a DSP. Yes. You know, and in terms of getting a variance, it's up to the agency what they want to do. We don't have any, you know, compelling thing that says they have to hire people. You know what I mean? Yes. To go, it could be something else going on. It could be that the variance is, is not completely practical or entirely impractical for them, you know, within their, <clears throat> the roles of their of their workers and things like that. But anyway, from, from the standpoint of SDS, we're not compelling them to hire people that, you know, a person would bring with them to potentially be their employee. Should they explain it to the person? Yes. Should they try to work with them and see if they can get to know somebody else who could do the work? Yes. You know, um, is there a staffing shortage? Yes. I, I don't I don't have an easy answer. I mean, unless unless there's somebody on the call who has some kind of insight past those things. Because I think the biggest challenge is that the agency, the agency of choice is not wanting to do PCA. And um for, for that person. They don't want to do it for that person. Um, no, they don't want to do it for anyone. They're doing okay. it for the people that they have already, that they're already serving. But mm -hmm. right now I'm in the process of a few new waivers. And um, I know those people are going to need PCA services. And so I'm just kind of concerned where that puts them because this particular agency will take on everything but PCA. Mm -hmm. And I know this because I've talked to the agency and I, I formerly worked at the agency and at that time, they told me not to take any more PCA. Mm -hmm. So anyone that would get a CFC, and let's say they didn't meet, you know, full on ALI, if they were to get CFC just for the PCA portion, and they don't have a person here in Ketchikan, at least, we're not going to be able to get them served. Mm -hmm. So for I'm wondering what other people are doing. Uh, how do we yeah. deal with that? I'm just trying to think of different tools that you can use within the community. And in some of our other trainings, we where the goal is to like educate the Alaskan on how to hire. There are things that that person could do. They could, um, and it really kind of depends on 
I would encourage you as the care coordinator to kind of support them in this like process. You know, they've asked their inner circle. The next step would be to perhaps do a flyer like in a coffee shop or something like that. Saying, you know, looking, offering gig work, that kind of like need for personal care assistance. It's tricky though. It is tricky because then they have to, um, they will have to interview the person and like decide if they do want them. And then that person would have to go and get hired by the agency, you know? So it's like multiple step process. That's one technique that could work, but it, I think that it's worth noting that, you know, catch can isn't like Anchorage where there's that many people that you could find that. So, I, you know, I, I want to kind of give like acknowledgement of that, that maybe you really don't have people there to offer that support. So um, I'm just trying to think through other resources that we would have in that context. And I'm. Can I ask a question about that? This is still Cheryl. What, oh, um, if there was someone, let's say I knew someone, which I do, that is interested in providing those PCA services, but doesn't have, I mean, they don't obviously have an agency, like a couple of the direct service, uh, agencies that we have here. Is there somewhere I could direct them to, to call so that they are able to get, trained or have resources and someone helping them set that up. So does that make sense? So I know someone that's oh. willing to do it that used to work at the same agency as I did. They're willing to provide PCA services, but right now they're doing like a chore service, kind of like a housekeeping service. So they're, they're still vetted, you know, through their background check, probably for another year. And they're willing to open an agency. They just don't know how to do it. I'm thinking that could be a solution for us in Catch Can. I don't know if other areas have that, but they keep asking me about it. But I don't know enough about that side of the coin to tell them where to go to try and get an agency started. Do we have resources like that? We could, or does someone have a resource where I could say, here's who you contact, they can help you walk through that? Yeah, just have them email SDS training at alaska.gov and say, I want to start a PCS agency. You know, where do, how do I get started? We do have resources. We do have training. We do get a lot of uh, questions from people who want to be paid just to serve one person. They want to be paid from the state just to serve their one family member. And that is not something that works out because you, you have to work for an agency. And to establish an agency is a very extensive process and you have to be a business and you have to have a um an office space that's open to the public and you know you need to have a lot of these things kind of like sort of like starting a care coordination or another kind of agency uh so people don't you know become singleton pcas just to serve one person but people do become new agencies and we'd be happy to help them understand that mm -hmm. hey this is stephanie i was also going to suggest to reach out to other PCA agencies that are in the state that are, don't serve that region and see if they're willing to come there. Mm -hmm. Great suggestions. Mm -hmm. This may be a good conversation, guys, for our next provi oh, provider. In it's just saying. Yeah, definitely. Okay, I'm, you know, catching up on what's going on in some of the chats, and I'm looking at the conversation that we have about the 10% day have residents in residence, and the whole like, just in case concept, you know, there's bad weather, or something's going on. Um, <laughs> I think the most important thing to map with that, because the concept is real. We live in a real state where it's like very possible to get snowed in for several days and you're now doing day hab in residence. What we really need is the spelling it out and spelling out the units because it's a percentage, okay? So how do you map that out? Like, how would you, you, 
you know, it really depends on how the service, like what the person works on, the service delivery. So for an example, you know, if I have a consistent like day have experience once a week, that's like four hours of total time. I can map out in the year a certain amount of those that could possibly be for those weather related circumstances. You'd have to map how many of those are in a year, how many like snow days do you have? What will you do for those? Because like what, like we aren't going into the community and we're having the residency at home, what will we do? Will we do it online? Because that's a whole nother pocket of like, you know, rules related to that, which it's allowed, you know, you can have them run concurrently or separate the 10 percents or maybe day have would be, um, you know, within the house or over, you know, distance delivered. You'd have to just explain it. So the just in case, consider it as the term of structured flexibility, structured in the sense of we know when we can use it. We know what we will do when we use it, and we know how much is 10% of that usage. Hopefully that gives some help because it you can you can write the plan so it works in that context, but it has to be structured so that you know when it will happen and what you will do when it happens, when you're doing day hab in residence in those experiences. Any questions or thoughts from you all about that as you kind of think through that? It's kind of weird because we're talking about it very broadly. It's a lot easier when you dial it into a real case, but just kind of consider how would I use this? When would I use it? I can only use it for 10% of the total. Feeling good. Okay. <laughs> we can keep moving and you guys can leave whenever you want. We're at this point, just this total request Abby. live. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I was doing some math. Um, <laughs> so yep. I'm a little bit confused on that because we can't always anticipate, like, for example, if somebody gets invited to a birthday party at another group home, they may go when they're on day hab, but we don't know when they're going to get invited to the parties. So if we allot 10% to be used in a residence and they don't get invited to any birthday parties in a residence, can they then use the 10% in the community still? Are we losing it? You're not losing, you no, no losing money, like no, no losing the like unit or you don't, you won't lose it, so to speak. Okay. I think the big thing about it is that it's a structure, structured flexibility. So if we have a birthday party, if we're invited to go to that, I would frame it like that. You don't know when you're going to be going to the birthday party. But what you do want to allocate is like, how many times in the year could you do that activity? And for how long? Because you're breaking out that 10%. So it does kind of come into that concept of like, well, I have like out of your whole, whole like amount of the year, you have 10%. Of that 10%, you may use it for the following things. And then I would map out going to a birthday party. This is what we would do at the birthday party. Or at, or at other social events that are in homes. And then if there is um, inclemental weather that would result in it being unsafe to go out into the community, what would you do at home to engage in community? Would it be through distance delivery or not? If you're using distance delivery, that also digs into the whole like, what kind of supports does this person need? So that if like they need to like the group home needs to set up like someone being with them to like set up their computer for them. What does that look like? You know, those kind of pieces. So you could have it 
just be about weather. You could have it just be about having like social gatherings. You could have it as a mix. But what should be really clear is like the amount of for everybody involved, like the amount of instances that it could happen, like kind of come up with the plan of like, well, how often would we do this for how like and how long would that session be? So that as they occur, the whole team can go through and be like, okay, we have had five birthday parties and we know we have three more, you know, and then you might need, you know, like something um, you might need to adjust the plan because of something that's happening because of something unexpected or the, like there's been so many weather issues because of like our seven feet of snow, you know, that you used all of that 10% within the first like three months, you know, and so it's not a change in total units but you do need to get permission now for like maybe we need more in the future because of how it's worked out you just really want to establish the plan of use because when you leave it too loose that's when things happen where it's like well this time we did a six hour session and then last time we did two you know a two hour session and now we have no idea how many uh you know in resident sessions we had so being really clear about like how much, how often, and having a plan for that. If we get down to the last month of the plan and they haven't used any in a residence, we do not need to amend to use that last 10%? I I wouldn't. I, I, I think that that is something on renewal that to. you... <laughs> yeah, I don't think you should. I think that upon yeah. renewal, you should just clarify that, you know, we didn't have to use the our you know just in case time, but we're going to request it again. We used okay. everything according to plan, you know, like kind of keep okay. it in that context because it is intended to be flexible for these kind of environments where it's like you know the person just wants to be able to go to their aunt's tea party, you know, they just want to go, um, and they need a little support to be included in it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No, I think folks are dropping off. Yeah, just thanks for your patience with us with the Zoom. It's different. I know this is this is a, this is different, guys. This is on our end. I'm like I'm trying to keep track of the. I know channel. I like this better, but it's hard to see the questions. I like it better. Yeah, and I like it because people can talk. Yes, and it's and easier go to for the folks. questions were clear, but this is uh, overall I think a much better platform. We'll get used to it. Thank you for your patience with us. Yeah, definitely. We appreciate you and look forward to 2024 with you and uh, working together. So please mention keep one connecting. Thing. Go ahead, Abby. Uh, thank you for doing the Zoom. It's really nice to have a collaborative uh, session. And also, I just want to put a bug in your guys' ear that we're still dealing with people being dropped from Medicaid. It's not better. I don't know... Uh, if you guys are hearing it's better, but just today I found out another client was dropped without any notice. So just letting you guys know it's still out there for us. Just email me when those things come up, when you have those issues, like for this one, just email me the clients, okay. how many ID. I have, I have a person that has been fighting since October and it came down to a box that was checked in, inadvertently and she was totally kicked off, had to reapply, all this other stuff. And she has a she is um, someone on an IDD waiver that's managing her own care, has a small child. It reduced her SSI because then the state of Alaska wouldn't pay for her, her co-pay for her Medicare. It, it's a nightmare and it's still going on. I checked it today. And that's the, that's the fourth one I've had since August. So it's, it's, so right now I'm suggesting to all my, my clients that they send me, we do an ROI and they send me their application packet and I email it in because this is ridiculous. 
that um, it's very punitive for the, the people that are um, in this process and have been for years. And then all of a sudden, you know, you can't get you can't get any answer from um, DPA other than, oh, we're looking into it kind of thing. So this has been going on since her, she submitted her application in October. So um, and if I sign, sound passionate about this, I am because it's really affecting, you know, my clients and their services and stress where she's had to go to behavioral health to get help dealing with this issue. So well, we would feel just as panicked if our health insurance was turned off and we could right. access it. <laughs> well, not only that, not, you know, you're not getting your services, your money's being cut. It's Christmas. You have a five-year-old daughter. Yeah. You know, life, life circumstances were very challenging for this, this family. So it's, it's heartbreaking, you know, so. Thank you. Guys. <laughs> Yeah, it's also absolutely. difficult due to the staffing shortage. Right now, I have a client, a, a young boy. It took us over a year and a half to find staff that could work with him. He's not had Medicaid now since November. and He's on IDD waiver and mm -hmm. they are making us. I mean, I've I posted in this about the network and um, they for some reason on this long term care, they want all the family's information on income and everything. Is just it's all and the med one med two. It's like they're throwing all the paperwork at them, but they're not giving him his Medicaid back, and he can't get right. seizure meds. And it's I mean it's just compounding. So um, it it is got, still the fr the first of the month. I think many of us are really starting to dread it because you know that without yeah. a way to say it nicer, all hell breaks loose. You yeah, know, she got I fielded from, seven calls today of people not having Medicaid now. She got a letter today about the Medicaid buy-in for people who are working while disabled. She doesn't work. She hasn't worked in years. So I'm like, why is she even getting this kind of thing? You know, they they, they refused her, her uh, Gen 72, I think, and wanted her to fill out one that was for um, the, the cash benefit for her family, which she's never been eligible for. So, so this yeah. is Kara. Um, we're happy to help with the concerns with DPA and the, the communication with DPA. I know Kat's been working on that very hard. Um, and of course, as SDS, we want to improve that and, and reduce these kinds of outcomes for people. Um, but I think we could probably be more effective in helping you if you come to our office hour, you know, for care coordinators or, or just shoot us an email and ask for a call back or something like that. And then we can sort of unpack the cases for you and you know I, I know where most of us are aware that um dpa reinstated renewals after not having renewals for medicaid because of covid and folks are struggling because they haven't gotten letters and circumstances have changed and there's new staff or not enough staff at dpa like there is here at sds and everywhere and so you have this a lot a lot of things that impact it but I think it's easier and better if we if we work on it with you one on one. Or you don't want to wait till office hours. Just shoot me an email and just include some of the dates, some like Harmony ID information, and I can follow up with our leadership on specific cases and just let them know that this is still what's going on and this is what we're seeing and hearing from care coordinators. Oh, go ahead, Susie. Uh, just real quick, because I got to jump off to Oni had asked up earlier if there was any, oh, what was it? It was about the regs when the new regs are coming out. Any word on that? Any word on when the new regs will happen? Is what Which set? Because, gosh, guys, a lot has happened during the pandemic and certain things are in play and certain ones are not. So... It really depends on which ones we're talking about. Um, Can we just keep an eye on the website then? Yeah, and Watch some your of email. them. Email yeah, alert. make sure make sure you're paying attention to the e alerts. We haven't gotten the formal time for when the flexibilities end yet. Wait, that like when the flexibilities have an end date. Right now, we're all kind of like maybe July first. So everything that's still that still hasn't been implemented is still um uh, still kind of going so like 
dehabilitation caps and um, NCES training requirements, like some of these are still um, in a flexible status. Other pieces are, are being um, implemented like, um, Kat, give me an example. <laughs> like employment services oh yes employment services so time limited employment services um so there are certain pieces that are being implemented and some haven't so it is very confusing so when we talk about what's in place we got to know which regulation are you talking about which package gotcha thanks have a good one, everyone. Bye. Yeah, thank you, Susie. I wish thank it was you. a nice, clean, everything's on, but it's not, not right now. Well, we're past time. Uh, please feel free to stop by care coordination or provider office hours this week if anything else is on your mind. And please let us know about issues that you're having with DPA or other provider related questions so that we can support you as best as we can. And with that, happy new year. Thank you.